Welcome to Around the Empire. I'm your host, Joanne Leon. Tonight, April 28th, 2018, we're doing a roundtable discussion, and we're happy to have two foreign policy journalists with us, also friends of the show. Kyle Anzalone is the host of Foreign Policy Focus podcast, and he's the editor-in-chief of ImmersionNews.com. He also writes the Daily News Roundup at Libertarian Institute. And Will Porter, a freelance journalist with a focus on U.S. foreign policy and conflicts abroad. And his work can be found at Libertarian Institute, Antiwar.com, and Consortium News. And my co-host Dan ran into some technical problems during the recording. Unfortunately, couldn't participate, but he'll be here for the next one. So tonight's topic is French President Macron's state visit at the White House, Congress, and about his grand plan for Iran and the Middle East. Without further ado, here is that roundtable discussion. So today we're going to have a roundtable. We're going to try out a new format, and we're excited to have Will Porter and Kyle Anzalone here with us, and we're going to talk about the Macron visit and everything uh, that that means from a foreign policy and a war standpoint. Welcome, Will, and welcome, Kyle. It's great to have you. Hey, yeah, thanks for having us on. Yeah, thanks for having us on. This should be fun. We just have to try not to talk over each other. <laughs> but um, to get started, I mean, there were sort of several really key events from the Macron visit. And the first one was the presser, I think, if it was, you know, other than the fluff. The first one was the presser where we heard from Trump and Macron before we heard any real details about what Macron was proposing. And then we had the, the Macron speech to the joint session of Congress, where most of the meat of the visit was, I thought. And um, and they had the state dinner and probably things I missed. So. The Trump presser came before the speech to Congress, but this was before Trump heard the Macron speech. Let's get into what he said about Syria. As far as Syria is concerned, uh, I would love to get out. I'd love to bring our incredible warriors back home. They've done a great job. We've essentially uh, just absolutely obliterated ISIS in Iraq and in Syria. And we've done a big favor to neighboring countries, frankly, but we've also done a favor for our country. With that being said, uh, Emmanuel and myself have discussed the fact that we don't want to give Iran open season to the Mediterranean, especially since we really control it to a large extent. We really have controlled it and we've set control on it. So we'll see what happens. But we're going to be coming home relatively soon. We finished at least almost our work with respect to ISIS in Syria, ISIS in Iraq. And we have done a job that nobody has been able to do. But with that being said, I do want to come home, but I want to come home also uh, with having accomplished what we have to accomplish. So we are discussing Syria as part of an overall deal. When they made the Iran deal, what they should have done is included Syria, when I say should have, before giving them, Iran, $150 billion and $1.8 billion in cash, $1.8 million in cash. If you think about this, before giving this kind of tremendous money, okay, $150 billion and $1.8 billion in cash, in barrels, I hear it was taken out, And in boxes, it was taken out. Cash. They should have made a deal that covered Yemen, that covered Syria, that covered other parts of the Middle East where Iraq is involved, where Iran is involved. They didn't do that. So we want to come home. We'll be coming home. But we want to have a very, very strong, we want to leave a strong and lasting footprint. And that was a very big part of our discussion. Okay. So, what do you guys think of that one? I thought Man. it showed that Trump 
probably knows next to nothing about actual Middle East policy. I mean, at one point he complains that the situation in Yemen wasn't resolved by the Iran nuclear agreement. But if anybody even reads the New York Times, you'll see that the situation in Yemen uh, started because the United States was placating Saudi Arabia's uh, being upset that the United States made the nuclear agreement with Iran. If you look at how he talks about how our Arab partners aren't, aren't doing enough in Syria and they need to start doing more. Well, our Arab partners in Syria were the ones that aided, you know, the rise of the Islamic State and the, you know, Sunni rebellion to Assad, which mostly turned out to be uh, jihadist extremists like Al Qaeda and ISIS. And the only other, you know, country in the area that you know, has geopolitical goals outside their own borders, really, you know, it would be Iran who's fighting in Syria, and yet that's the one country I have, Trump's condemning. It, it makes absolutely no sense to me how you know, what, what his plan could possibly be. We're going to defeat ISIS, but then support countries that are going to help ISIS and oppose the country that's opposing ISIS. It's, he has absolutely no, no concept of what's actually going on. Yeah. I found that to, this, this clip to be a doozy. It is full of, uh, I mean, there's so much to address in that. Um, everything from the Iran deal to like, he starts it out by saying he wants U- U S troops out of Syria, but then he lays out like a, an impossible list of goals that we have to accomplish before that. Uh, the least of which is not a political transition of Assad. Now, I, I forget how uh, explicit he is in this presser about that, but there's there's many references that Macron and Trump make to like a, a political solution in Syria. So it's not just about defeating ISIS. We have to you know make peace there and make sure everything is resolved, which um, that is not a very good rep- recipe for get, stop being involved for for getting out of there for you know. So yeah, it's our I mean, responsibility. He, he oh, contradicts ahead. himself. He says we're, we want to come home but we want to leave a lasting footprint. I mean, he tells us a little bit later, he he implies that it's not us that's going to leave that lasting footprint, that somebody else is going to do it. Like here's, here's the other significant thing he said in that presser. This is about the allies in the region. And countries that are in the area, some of which are immensely wealthy, would not be there except for the United States and, to a lesser extent, France. But they wouldn't be there except for the United States. They wouldn't last a week. We are protecting them. They have to now step up and pay for what's happening. Because I don't think France or the United States should be liable for the tremendous cost. Uh, The United States is embarrassingly into the Middle East as of a few months ago, as you've heard me say before, and I don't take responsibility, but I would be very embarrassed if I had to, $7 trillion. And when we want to build, Mr. President, our infrastructure, everybody says, oh, we want to be careful with our money. When we want to fix a highway or we want to build schools and lots of other things, tunnels, bridges, they say, oh, let's be careful with our money. And yet we have spent seven trillion dollars in the middle east and we've gotten nothing for it nothing less than nothing as far as i'm concerned that's over an 18-year period the countries that are there that you all know very well are immensely wealthy they're going to have to pay for this and i think the president and i agree very much on that and they will pay for it they will pay for it We've spoken to them. They will pay for it. The United States will not continue to pay. And they will also put soldiers on the ground, which they're not doing. And we will, in fact, bring lots of people home. We will have a strong blockage to the Mediterranean, which to me is very important. Because if we don't, you have Iran going right to the Mediterranean. Not going to have that. But there is a chance, and nobody knows what I'm going to do on the 12th, although, Mr. President, you have a pretty good idea. But we'll see. But we'll see also if I do what some people expect, whether or not it will be possible to do a new deal with solid foundations, because this is a deal with decayed foundations. It's a bad deal. It's a bad structure. It's falling down should have never, ever been made. I blame Congress. I blame a lot of people for it. But it should have never been made. And 
We're going to see what happens on the 12th. But I will say, uh, if Iran threatens us in any way, they will pay a price like few countries have ever paid. Okay? I don't know what that last bit about if Iran threatens us uh, is about, but, you know, this is a guy who's clearly conflicted, um, blaming everybody else around him for the fact that he's going to stay in Syria, it sounds like to me, anyway. Right. And and he says that, you know, they're going to pay for it. That seems to be his biggest gripe. Um, But he also says they're going to put troops on the ground. Now, that sounds good, but, um, you know, how are you going to do that when you're surrounded on all sides by hostile, you know, forces, or at least three sides anyway? Right, right. And two two things here I'd have to say just real quick. Uh, first of all, he says he's going to get other countries to pay for this. What is this? What is he referring? Does he mean fighting ISIS or does he mean the whole political solution in Syria? Is he like, what is Do you guys, do either of you know, do you think it's an Islamic state? I, I I sense that he meant um, an escalation that's coming, and they're going to pay for, you know, the occupation of northeast Syria and whatever else. Right. Ma- Macron talks pretty big in in his congressional speech about what they containment the containment of of Iran in not only Syria right. but in Yemen, in Lebanon, in Iraq. It's right. a pretty big. It's a pretty big project. Uh, that's a tall order. And yeah. uh, Saudi, like like regional allies like Saudi have been pouring, like they've been expending a lot of money, but into rebel groups and stuff, right. not necessarily. So uh, so he talks about getting regional allies to contribute more. It's like, well, they've been involved. It's just he won't he won't tell you with what, you know. Yeah, something funny happened right after this. I mean, right after this, uh, the Saudi foreign minister, Jubair is his, his last name. He immediately released a statement saying that, implying that Trump was referring to Cotter in that speech and that Cotter has to to pay for it. But I'm pretty sure that Trump wasn't just talking about Cotter. Right. And you would think that uh, Cotter funding it would be some kind of uh, problem with Turkey because Cotter is pretty relying on Turkey at this point because of the Saudi blockade and everything uh, as with Iran. And so is Cotter going to go and occupy Northeast Syria to keep it Safe for the Kurds, not only from Assad, but from Erdogan and Turkey. I mean, that, you know, seems like it would create a lot of problems. And I think that's one of you know, the things that Trump is trying to figure out how to solve here is that, you know, our Gulf Arab allies aren't all getting along and uh, it's causing a lot of problems because you really can't develop this policy. You can't have Qatar go in there and help the Kurds uh, because of their relationship with Turkey and their dependence on Turkey right now. And the, I, I would assume the same thing, that it's just pushing them closer and closer to Iran. Uh, the more Trump is trying to force them, I guess, to align with Saudi Arabia, uh, because they're going to have to bounce off of that. Unless Saudi Arabia uh, decides to end the blockade, which I know Trump advised them to do, but I haven't heard if there's any movement on that recently. So it, it seems that Trump, is, I mean, is in a real sticking point here. I also found it interesting that he talked about Iran getting access to the Mediterranean, I don't know why that would be any kind of threat. It's not like Iran doesn't have open water ports. I mean, I, I guess it takes a lot more to go around Africa or whatever, but it's not like I'm sure that Iran isn't going to be much doing much shipping through the desert of Iraq and Syria. That's you know not exactly a safe road or anything. So maybe he's just trying to downplay the attention to Israel because that's you know what the the land bridge, which is what I assume he's talking about, is from Tehran right. to Beirut and the threat to Israel. But I don't know why he doesn't mention it and doesn't phrase it that way, but that they have access to the Mediterranean. What threat that would be? I mean, Iran has, what, one battleship? <laughs> so yeah. I, I don't understand what, what the threat is if Iran could reach the Mediterranean Sea. And, and just, just to piggyback off that, too, I, th- I found it funny in the speech where just like just a couple of seconds prior to the clip we just listened to, Macron said something about, you know, we have to prevent uh, hegemony in the region. We have to make sure there's no hegemony. And then not 30 seconds later, Trump says something about how we control the Mediterranean. We have to it's, we have to maintain that. It's like so you want to prevent hegemony of some sort, I guess, but not not altogether, apparently. Yeah, I, I think you're right that it's Iranian dominance is what they're talking about, I guess. But and I, I guess he's talking about that land bridge. I mean, the only 
unless he's talking about actually breaking through part of Turkey to the men. I, nah, I, I just don't, I don't think he, I think he sounds like a very confused man. Um, he just yeah. sounds pissed off. He sounds like he's being dragged into something that he, he wants to walk away from his instincts. Tell him just get out of there. And, you know, he's got all this pressure on him to, to stay. And I don't know, Frank, I won't get into that. I think he's cut a deal, frankly, um, to have less domestic pressure at home and maybe the Mueller investigation or whatever if he if he changes his views on foreign policy and goes along with the establishment. But you know, that's just a hunch on my part. Yeah, but Macron gets into it in more detail. But the thing is, it, it doesn't sound a whole lot different than what they were trying to do with the Geneva process. They just don't want to lose control of this area and they are losing control of this area. So do you want to, before we just go, go through a lot of other stuff, do you want to listen to some of the Macron clips or you want to put that off to a little, a little bit? I don't know. What do you want to do Kyle? Uh, Macron clips sound good to me. Okay. Um, I think I'll skip over the first one. I'll I'll just tell you that it was, you know, all about our long history, although it was geared toward war and revolution and things like that. And um, it, pretty much just reminding us that the, we wouldn't be here without their help or things like that. And then he goes on a lot about freedom. In this part, I you know, I just felt like I was back to Bush in 2002 and 2003. I didn't know whether he went on like this because France, you know, remember the whole freedom fries thing when, you know, France didn't join us in the invasion of Iraq, whether it was sort of like trying to make up for that or, um, I don't know, this is weird. Listen to this. In recent years, our nations have suffered wrenching losses simply because of our values and our taste for freedom. Because these values are the very ones those terrorists precisely hate. Tragically, on September the 11th, 2001, many Americans had an unexpected rendezvous with death. Over the last five years, my country and Europe also experienced terrible terrorist attacks. And we shall never forget these innocent victims nor the incredible resilience of our people in the aftermath. It is a horrific price to pay for freedom, for democracy. That is why we stand together in Syria and in Sahel today to fight together against these terrorist groups who seek to destroy everything for which we stand. We have encountered countless rendezvous with death because we have this constant attachment to freedom and democracy. The reason he keeps bringing up rendezvous with death is that there's an earlier reference to the epitaph on a tombstone of an American soldier who died in France. So he, right. ke he keeps repeating that theme. So, you know, we're back to um, they hate us for our freedoms. I mean, literally, that's what he's drilling up again. And I, I don't know. I was very surprised. Now he starts getting into some more specifics, bigger picture here. I don't know yeah, how many times this guy said world order, but he said, yeah, yeah a lot of times. He just real quick, it. just yeah, real sure. quick before we advance. Uh, I just wanted to point out the fact that in that little clip you just heard, he literally says uh, terrorism is the price we pay for democracy. Like that. Oh, did I he just, say oh my God. I'm pretty sure he said that in this uh, in this clip here. At some point in the speech, he definitely says that, and he says a lot of things very similar to it. But I find that to be one of the most dangerous like framings as far as broad strokes of the speech. Uh, you know, we're back again, as you said, to this whole thing that it's all you know, it's the price we pay for freedom and democracy. When our terrorism problems, our security problems, have nothing to do with our elections. The fact that we have elections. You know, they're they're for policies. It's you know, terrorism is the price you pay for empire, not for democracy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I find it amazing that, you know, in this, he, he then invoked Syria as an example of the United States fighting against the terrorists, where that's, you know, one of the battlefields where we're fighting for the Sunni jihadists on that, you know, front. There's certainly been an ISIS enclave, you know, right next to the, you know, U.S. controlled territory through our you know, 
proxy Syrian Kurdish forces that's just been sitting there for months on end. I think the most recent government to bomb it was the Iraqi government worked out a deal with the Syrian government where they went and bombed that territory because the United States coalition wasn't doing it. And so it, it makes no sense. Uh, you know, to say that we had to fight against terrorists and then you know, at least not cite Afghanistan, where in that case, at least the United States is fighting against the Sunnis, even if the Taliban aren't, uh, you know, really Al Qaeda like rebels. Uh, you know, the American people believe that much. And so it, it, it's amazing that he pits that battlefield uh, with, with the situation he's invoking. I mean, he just literally runs, reruns the script from, you know, before the Iraq invasion. Yeah, and I feel like American leaders like almost stopped making these kind of justifications to the American people. Like we, be- I don't really, I haven't heard the whole "we're fighting for freedom" thing in, in a few years. Maybe people do still say it, but it's almost just like these are all just these conflicts are just nebulous. Like they're self justifying. We don't have they don't have to bring it to the American people and say, "Oh, it's for freedom, everybody." It's just like uh, I don't know, never ending wars there. For the left, it's really shifted to the like, like responsibility to protect position that we have to go over there and do that, uh, you know, to protect the people. And then from the right wing, uh, they, they seem to mostly be the, you know, my Pompeo narrative that this is an existential battle of the, you right. know, free, not me, free world, the Western world and the Christian Judeo values versus Muslim culture and the Muslims. Right. And so, you know, they, they've even moved away from the, they hate us because we're free. Now they just hate us because it's, this is the existential battle between the West and uh, the, the Arab world. Right. But here's Macron reviving that, that line. Here we are again, you know, now, now Macron starts talking about, I think he says militarism, but I think he means militarism. He starts getting more specific about he want what he wants the United States to do. Oh, sorry. It's not the militarism yet. First, he starts talking about world order. So he never mentions the word empire once, but he does talk about 21st century world order, which I think is just a synonym for Western empire, if you will. Here he goes. But we must remember the warning of President Theodore Roosevelt. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, handed on for them to do the same. (laughs) This is an urgent reminder indeed, because now, going beyond our bilateral ties, Beyond our very special relationship, Europe and the United States must face together the global challenges of this century. And we cannot take for granted our transatlantic history and bonds. At the core, our Western values themselves are at risk. We have to succeed facing these challenges And we cannot succeed in forgetting our principles and our history. In fact, the 21st century has brought a series of new threats and new challenges that our ancestors might not ever have imagined. Our strongest beliefs are challenged by the rise of a yet unknown new world order. Our societies are concerned about the future of their children. All of us gathered here in this noble chamber, we, elected officials, all share the responsibility to demonstrate that democracy remains the best answer to the questions and doubts that are raised today. Even if the foundations of our progress are disrupted, We must stand firmly and fight to make our principles prevail. But we bear another responsibility inherited from our collective history. Today, the international community needs to step up our game and build the 21st century world order, 
based on the perennial principles we established together after World War II. The rule of law, the fundamental values on which we secured peace for 70 years, are now questioned by urgent issues that require our joint action. So what the heck is he talking about there? Heard a he yet said, unknown new world order? Yeah. I mean, I assume he's talking about Russia and China, but. Right. I thought it was really strange that he just didn't label Russia and China. I, I mean, the United States already has called those the reformist powers or, uh, you know, like road states or states looking to create a new world order, I think is a phrase that Rex Tillerson himself used. And so I find it odd that he's trying to be so ominous here and saying, oh, there's a yet unknown secret world power looking to take over. I don't know, like maybe Iran's going to link up with North Korea or something crazy like this. <laughs> when everybody you know, has been constantly talking about, at least in the U.S. for the past year, about how you know, Russia is on the rise and looking to expand their you know, power and influence around the world. And so that, that's nothing new. And so to be so vague about it, it, it was really strange to me. And how that, you know, this is what we have to fight against. And, you know, that he really implies that the only way to defeat this power is through military action, uh, saying that we must fight to defend our values or our principles. Macron does start to get a little more specific. First, he talks about isolation, isolationism. This got a lot of play in the news, um, but they, they didn't really give you much context. So I'll give you a little more context. Let me say we have two possible ways ahead. We can choose isolationism, withdrawal, and nationalism. This is an option. It can be tempting to us as a temporary remedy to our fears. But closing the door to the world will not stop the evolution of the world. It will not douse but inflame the fears of our citizens. We have to keep our eyes wide open to the new risks right in front of us. I'm convinced that if we decide to open our eyes wider, we will be stronger. We will overcome the dangers. We will not let the rampaging work of extreme nationalism shake a world full of hopes for greater prosperity. It is a critical moment. If we do not act with urgency as a global community, I am convinced that the international institutions, including the United Nations and NATO, will no longer be able to exercise a mandate and stabilizing influence. We would then inevitably and severely undermine the liberal order we built after World War II. All the powers with a stronger strategy and ambition will then fill the void we will leave empty. All the powers will not hesitate one second to advocate their own model to shape the 21st century world order. Personally, if you ask me, I do not share the fascination for new strong powers, the abandonment of freedom, and the illusion of nationalism. So now he's getting to the meat of it. New or 21st century world order means continuing to be the sole superpower, I think. Uh, and he's, he's talking about not just the U.S. as a superpower, but NATO. NATO is the superpower. And he's doing a bit of fear-mongering there about how somebody, instead of there being just a multipolar world, he's like saying they're going to take over. I think that's what he's getting at. Sure, sure. And I found like this this clip I noted, he really makes a false dichotomy here. I hate when people do this where it's either we're the world empire where we're doing all, the, all what we're currently doing or we're isolationist and we have to like close our doors to the world. It's that's a false dichotomy. You can have your doors open and, you know, maintain trade, maintain trade and diplomacy with other nations without bombing and invading everybody else. So you don't have to be an isolate. You don't have to you know seal up your borders and be fortress America and be extreme nationalists to be against this kind of, uh, you know, uh, I don't I hesitate to say globalism, but that sort of thing. Uh, I, I just think it's a false dichotomy. 
Right. And it's even worse than that because it's kind of in, in a way untrue. I mean, right. This is like the most common criticism of Ron Paul is that he's some kind of isolationist. And his point was, is I don't want to sanction Cuba. I don't want to sanction North Korea. I don't want to sanction Iran. I think we should be doing business with those countries in order to, you know, help spread our message and intertwine our cultures and stuff like that. And, you know, he makes the point that the real isolationists are those who are constantly wanting to wage war because that's what's creating the barriers. I, I mean, the reason that the U.S. and uh, Russia aren't getting along right now isn't because, you know, the, the isolationists are, are running amok. It's because, you know, the, the globalists and the people that have uh, Marcon's p- position and background are demanding sanctions against Russia. And, and so it's completely ridiculous to blame the problem on isolationism when clearly the, the problem is, is, you know, trying to have an empire and seeing that, you know, any threat to NATO hegemony in the world is a threat to the, the everybody in the West is the way he makes it sound is that every man, woman and child here is under threat unless we control everything everywhere. And that could mean Afghanistan. That could mean Crimea. That could mean Syria. Uh, that could mean North and South Korea. But you know, if the world order isn't ours, then there's the, it's a threat to us. I mean, even the S- South China Sea at this point, I just saw yesterday, uh, Trump had ordered a couple uh, a B-52 and some F-15s to fly over the South China Sea. And that if China raises a stink about that, we're, you know, saying that they're trying to disrupt our global order and this is a threat to us. And it's like, you know, this is their Gulf of Mexico. What are you talking about? Yeah. Or freedom of passage, you know, or trying to maintain freedom of passage. I I think it's like the same old thing where if you, if they told the truth that they just want to maintain dominance and they want to maintain the empire. Nope. Nobody wants to fight for that. People will fight to defend themselves. So the, it's curious because later on he starts talking about fear mongering and things like that. And that's exactly what the man's doing. Uh, But he never uses the word empire. This reminded me a lot of the things that John McCain says. John McCain was usually the guy who put this uh, 21st century world order message across. And now Macron's doing, but here's, here he is talking about militarism and how we need to maintain it. We have to shape our common answers to the global threats that we are facing. The only option then is to strengthen our cooperation. We can build the 21st century world order based on a new breed of multilateralism, based on a more effective, accountable, and results-oriented multilateralism, a strong multilateralism. This requires, more than ever, the United States' involvement as your role was decisive for creating and safeguarding today's free world. The United States is the one who invented this multilateralism. You are the one now who has to help to preserve and reinvent it. Really? Do we? The hell was that? See here, I thought he was being even more sneaky than, than you're saying. I thought he was saying multilateralism. And, but obviously what he means is indeed militarism, for sure. But, uh, but so oh, I thought he was even being less... Multilateralism, he was saying? It's very oh. hard to understand what he... To it, make was. Him out. It, it was. It was. Yeah, I thought it was militarianism. Tarianism. Yeah, it was like it was weird how he was saying whatever he was saying. I think regardless of what he's saying, though, I think what he means indeed is militarism. Yeah. <laughs> like whether or not he said, you know. Yeah. I just don't know if he's being as honest about it. I didn't find the transcript to the full speech, but I found that quote here. Uh, in a Reuters article and it says the United States is the one who invented uh multilateralism. Oh, so it wasn't ever invented. Ah, really? Okay, so, so he's maybe even... I misinterpreted it completely. Multilateralism, an alliance of multiple countries pursuing a common goal. We I, I mean, I still interpreted it as it being militarism. I, generally, that like what Will was saying that he, I mean, he was talking about. That the U.S. must enforce the our role is to guard the free world. The U.S. must enforce this. I, I had and taken I, it that he meant 
U.S. led bombing missions like in Syria, where you know exactly. maybe the French and the British take part and drop two two bombs themselves, but the other a hundred and something are dropped by the United States. So that, that yeah, was I, my take on it, at least. I thought he even made reference to Syria when he's talking about it too, like as an example of how we be how we're multilateral. We carry out these kind of joint bombing raids on you know Syria. I could be mistaken though, but yeah. if he mentions that. I might have blown that whole thing all together, though, because I kind of i I planted that in your heads that it, that he was saying militarism. So I probably, I don't know. Uh, maybe maybe this discussion, like fleshing it out, is is good too. I don't know because I doubt we we would be the only ones who would mishear that. It sounds a lot like he is saying militarism. Yeah, like slightly mispronouncing it or something. But he's he's still he's talking about world order. He's talking about you know, keeping things the way we set them up after World War II. And he's talking about these great big threats who are going to take over and change the model and all of that. So how are you going to do that without a military? You know, how are you going to do it without force? Right, right well, exactly. I mean, Marcon's solution is have the United States military does it. He says that so clearly to the United States Congress. And, and the congressmen are standing there saying, whoa, what are you talking about? You mean you're going to send our boys and take our money to for our bombs every single time? They just all sit there and applaud. They're like, yeah, our role is to go and be the hammer for, you know, wherever Macron points us to go and, and drop it. And it's so sad that that's, you know, the, the way things work is that military, you know, he, I know he says multilateralism here, but militaryism is just so strong in the United States and is so supported by Congress that all you have to say is, yeah, you know, we're going to go bomb people and kick ass and they all clap and say, oh, yeah, that's exactly what we're going to do. I mean, I'm sure a large part of that has to do with, you know, all their donors absolutely love it in the military industrial complex. I mean, you know, they're, they're the ones that make the, the money from the bombs being dropped. Yeah. Well, every time they start talking about 21st century world order and, you know, the making sure that we keep things the way they were set up um, after World War II, you know, I, I just, I personally see it as selling another world war because at, we're at the point now where the only way you're going to prevent a multipolar world is to wage another world war, in my view. So. Sure. Yeah, I mean, in Trump's own uh, uh, national security strategy, he makes it very clear that he wants to like bring American foreign policy back into like big confrontations with big, uh, big powers like Russia and China. That was like one of the pla- the planks of that platform. So part of it was rogue states, rogue regimes. Part of it was terrorist groups, and then other the other component of it was large powers. And so it sounds like you're right that they're sort of sh- it's shaping up to be like large power blocks facing down, you know, facing off. You know, I think they changed the order of the whatever it is, the defense assessment. The top five threats are are now Russia, China and Iran. And um, terrorism is like number five on a list of five. Right. You what usually was- get North Korea as number three. It's oh, yeah, Russia North number Korea. one. China will be number two, which makes absolutely no sense. And then it's Iran north korea and then the the terrorist groups are like an afterthought they're like oh yeah we gotta kill the terrorists too it's silly that that that, that's of course the the last thought because of course if there are people plotting to actually attack america it's really not the russians i mean you know it seems like in, in several times putin has decided to either bat down or look for a you know a non-military solution and certainly uh you know not didn't start launching Russian anti-aircraft, you know, defense missiles against the U.S. planes as they're flying over Syria, launch an attack on any U.S. ships in the Mediterranean after the U.S. bomb there. And so it's hard to, like, fathom how you could say that Russia is a bigger threat to us than the only people uh, that, you know, really have any ambition to go in and attack the West, and that would be, you know, the ISIS-style jihadists. And, uh, you know, I I know the, the blowback reasons for that and stuff, but that's the point. Right. Yeah. Like it, the argument could be made that like these Al Qaeda type terror, you know, jihadi groups are the only enemy, genuine enemies America has in the world. And yet we do everything we possibly can to strengthen and bolster those groups, whether directly or indirectly, like as we've seen in Syria uh, with the, the backing of rebel groups and stuff. But it's funny they put that so low on the list of threats when really, arguably, that's the only one we even have. It's the only enemy America even has in the world. Um, and Macron just just sort of like lifted them back up to the top of the list, didn't he? I mean, he started out this speech with the, 
you know, we have to fight terrorism and they hate us for our freedoms and, and all that stuff. So he's like, I don't know. Things are so, so mixed up. But, you know, he's he's still staying at the macro level. But now he starts getting into the micro level where he starts talking about, I don't know if I should play this or not, the fake news thing, fake news threat. I, I don't understand why he puts this into the speech, but listen to what he says. To protect our democracies, we have to fight against the ever-growing virus of fake news, which exposes our people to irrational fear and imaginary risks. And let me attribute the fair copyright for this expression, fake news, especially here. <laughs> without reason, without truth, there is no real democracy. Because democracy is about true choices and rational decisions. The corruption of information is an attempt to corrode the very spirit of our democracies. We also have to fight against the terrorist propaganda that spreads out its fanaticism on the Internet. Yeah. It has a gripping influence on some of our citizens and children. I want this fight to be part of our bilateral commitment, and we discuss with your president the importance of such an agenda. I want this fight to be part of the J7 agenda because here again, it deeply harms our rights and shared values. So before this, the parts I didn't bring in where he's talking about culture and a lot of other things that we need to do. Um, he talks about climate change and, you know, there's no planet B. So maybe you could just say this is at the end of, of that list of cultural and other other things but I, I thought it was pretty weird that he, because you know the fake news thing is really a reason to censor uh, the, that's the way i've seen it approached from from the government standpoint and i saw this as one of the most orwellian things he said he said that you have to have truth and reason and rational you know information to make rational decisions when the only thing i see happening is less and less you know, freedom of uh, availability, uh, you know, they're burying independent media and things like that. Right. I, I mean, part of it may be that he outright lies in the speech as we brought up with the, you know, U.S. policy in Syria and how it actually aids and abets the jihadist groups. And so, uh, you know, and then there's shows like ours and all kinds of other alternative media that point out the truth on this. And they say, hey, look at what's actually going on here. And if you read the government's own documents, you'll find Absolutely, that the U.S. policy, they thought they could manage the Sunni rebellion, but it got out of control. And now we have the situation out. I mean, these are the words of John Kerry. But people who bring that up threaten their narrative. And so they have to, you know, kind of set the stage and prime people to hear that, hey, people are going to be telling you things that don't match up with what I'm telling you, but don't listen to it. I mean, I think uh, me and you actually exchanged some tweets after the uh, strikes on Syria. And you had the, uh, I think her name is Dana White. And she's the Pentagon's press spokesman saying that uh, there's going to be a lot of misinformation from Russian bots out there. So everybody be careful and we'll keep you informed on what's going on. And so their narrative and the reality that they paint is so far away from the truth that I think they have to prime people to say, hey, you're going to hear you know things that aren't true and just listen to us and we'll make sure we'll tell you the truth. And he goes a little bit the fear mongering path saying that it's a threat on our democracy uh, to make people, you know, have like hostilities against others who are proposing alternative views. Yeah, I, yeah. I completely agree with you on that. Yeah, it's a threat. Yeah. The real, real information is a threat to the power elite at the moment. Yeah, I think this is absolutely just a bludgeon like used for people like us in the alternative media. I mean, if you guys remember that Washington Post piece that covered this group called Prop or Not, uh, which basically tried to like put together this blacklist, this smear list where, uh, you know, Consortium News, Antiwar.com, Ron Paul's site, 
you know, all kinds of like, it's not Russian bots. These are genuine people with, with real opinions and real views. Uh, but yet these are just dismissed as being agents of a foreign power. So I think what Macron is saying in this speech really dovetails with that whole, this whole atmosphere in our country right now of anybody who goes against the line is a, is a Russian stooge or something. Yeah. It's just the way they have to shut, shut people down. They can't, you know, they, they have a concentration of media, but that's not enough anymore because we have the internet because we have social media and we have other alternative media platforms. So now they have to resort to Macar you know, McCarthyism tactics. And I guess we should think of the context too. At the moment, those strikes, all the, the stories that justified those strikes that France was a big, well, I think they were a big part of anyway. It was mainly us, the UK and, and France, uh, you know, their narratives not holding up. So, I guess you could see why Congress would uh, would cheer the whole fake news thing because they're panicked. They've got to be panicked to some extent. Yeah, the other kind of censorship he talks about here is, uh, you know, the terrorist propaganda, which, of course, most of this is just videotapes of U.S. and, you know, French and other Western military actions across the Middle East. I mean, it's just showing that U.S. bombs and French bombs and, you, you know, especially like the U.K. and Yemen, their involvement there. Uh, there, there's so many crimes committed against the people of the Muslim world that they're able to just show this. I mean, if, if you just look at the videos from the Israeli return march protest, I mean, it, it absolutely outrages you to see that there, there's snipers taking shots at little kids holding rocks smaller than their fists. Are you kidding me? That's a threat to your tank, a kid throwing a rock. Uh, but, you know, this is the kind of stuff that's produced. And so it, it, I think in some ways it's led to uh, this is something that I know Air Wars has talked about in a couple other groups that YouTube and stuff is now taking all that evidence off of their website and then it's lost forever. And so in some cases, this is like the only evidence of war crimes uh, because, you know, people don't walk around with the videotapes on their phone. So they upload it to YouTube. And then now YouTube is going through and deleting this and some because some of it's labeled as terrorist propaganda and or it's too graphic and violent. But, the, you know, this is the other kind of censorship that I think Marcone is talking about here. Yeah, and they can use it to justify instituting policies. If you notice, he said that he wants it to be a bilateral. He wants like a, a bilateral agreement and multilateral. He wants it to be a J7 policy. So they want to sort of, I guess, institute some type of policies or laws or regulations against fake news, which I don't know whether he's talking about making them consistent through different countries or what, but it was yeah. creepy in any, in any case it was, and it just didn't seem to fit. It, it wasn't, it's almost like he interjected, he, like he injected that into a speech that was much more um, uh, up another level or something. But he is now starting to get into the details of things. And the next thing he talks about is that four pillars. He talks about a comprehensive deal. And of course, the timing of this is has to do with the fact that the Iran deal, we're just in, what, like two weeks away now from the need to renew the deal or, or whatever it is. And he's over here trying to get Trump not to not to back out of the JCPOA Iran deal. What he wants him to do instead is he wants it to leave it in place and then he wants to build on that. And when he talks about a much bigger comprehensive deal and, and this deal with respect. I don't know if the whole deal has four pillars or just the part. Yeah, I think the whole deal has four pillars. So here he is on that. Your president and your country will have to take in the current days and weeks its own responsibilities regarding this issue. But what I want to do and what we decided together with your president is that we can work on a more comprehensive deal addressing all this concern. That is why we have to work on this more comprehensive deal based, as discussed with President Trump yesterday, on four pillars. The substance of the existing agreement, especially if you decide to leave it. The post-2025 period, in order to be sure that we will never have any nuclear activity for Iran. 
the containment of the military influence of the Iranian regime in the region and the monitoring of ballistic activity. I think these four pillars, the one I addressed in front of the General Assembly of the United Nations last September, are the one which cover the legitimate fears of the United States and our allies in the region. So this is the, the comprehensive deal. He wants us to not leave the Iran deal, but he wants to expand it like hugely. So the four pillars are one is leave the current Iran deal in place. Two is extend it so that Iran can never have nuclear weapons. This is my understanding. To tell me if I'm wrong. Three is to contain Iran in the whole region, whatever. He goes into some more detail about containment. And number four is to monitor their ballistic missile program. So he lays out his plan for not leaving the Iran deal, which, if I remember right, uh, the Saudis weren't happy with the Iran deal. The Israelis weren't happy with the Iran deal. But the Israelis said that they, like, they'd be okay with the Iran deal, but it needs changes. So, like, I, I assume the things they want maybe weren't taken into consideration. But um, right, so, least, something, uh, something. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say. Um, Funny thing about Israel, I believe it was Benjamin Netanyahu who said this in 2015 while the thing was still being negotiated. He said, uh, our biggest fear is that Iran won't cheat and won't violate the deal. And so I think that's really the Israeli and the Saudi fear here is that it's actually going to work and that it's going to take away this outstanding uh, bludgeon, this thing that you can you know, threaten Iran all the time through these outstanding nuclear issues. Now, the funny thing about Macron and his whole position here is he paints himself as being like in, in a distinction to Donald Trump. But if you notice, he basically just repeats all of Donald Trump's talking points. He just articulates them better in a more sophisticated way. Because Trump has always said, you know, uh, Iran's violating the spirit of the deal with its ballistic missile tests. And it's uh, the, the biggest state sponsor of terrorism. And so Macron is just taking all of Trump's talking points about why the JCPOA is so bad. And basically just saying, I like the JCPOA, but no, Trump is right about all these outstanding issues. Um, so I just find it funny. It's almost like they're doing like a good cop, bad cop kind of routine here <laughs> where Trump is the, you know, the grumpy old, uh, you know, belligerent one. And Macron is saying, no, no, everybody, don't worry. We in the EU, we still like the deal, but we still have to address all these, you know, million other issues, all the issues under the sun, you know. But he doesn't mention the reality of the situation, which is that, you know, a lot of people in Europe don't want they don't want they want to keep this deal. Maybe all of Europe. I, I don't think. I think this is a good thing for Europe, particularly Germany wants to continue investing in Iran. You know, they want to be able to, it was never even fully implemented. They want to be able to do transactions to, you know, facilitate trade and business transactions. So why wasn't he just honest about why they want the Iran deal to stay in place? Like I was surprised by that. Yeah. I, maybe it's because he was addressing Congress and, trying to sell it to the Americans rather than the French people. I thought that was odd too, because it, it didn't seem like in this at all, he would have addressed any interest of, of the French people or of France. I'm not sure why that it would be good for France to, you know, uh, contain Iran in the Middle East or anything like that. I mean, he just kind of said, you know, the Western world order thing. Um, so, so that was, it kind of seemed to me that he was just trying to sell it to the Americans. Uh, but like Will said, I, I mean, a lot of it's the same stuff and it, it doesn't even make sense or it, it's not achievable anyways. You're going to really reach a deal that solves all the problems in Yemen, Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon at the same time, as well as uh, address Iran's uh, ballistic missile program. I, I mean, why would you a attempt to solve all these pro problems at the same time or solve them all through the uh. Iran deal anyways? I mean, if you look at the situation in Turkey where you have Israel involved, you have uh, or in Syria, you have Israel involved, Turkey involved, Russia involved. Uh, I mean, there's even you know some Chinese involvement in there now. It, it seems absolutely impossible to reach a deal for Syria and other territories in the Middle East. 
and and then too, uh, he they talk about like you know Iran never getting or having the ability to get nuclear weapons. I mean, I, I don't know what they're even talking about at this point. I, Iraq or Iran only has the light water reactors, anyways. They, they got rid of their heavy water reactor, and so they're just about as far away from nuclear weapons as they could possibly ever be. And so I guess maybe it's steady the deadlines on the uh, uh, like to limit the amount of nuclear waste they could hold or something like that is a step that would actually keep uh, Iran uh, an extra step away from nuclear weapons. But at the same time, uh, it doesn't actually do anything to prevent Iran from getting nuclear weapons. And I assume that, that he just assumes that and nobody in Congress knows anything about nuclear weapons or, or that whole process or the deal itself, which they don't. Yeah, I mean, it is completely unrealistic. And it it's going to get even more unrealistic when you listen to this one. The next thing he talks about is he, you know, he just told us about the four pillars and now he's going to expand on one of the four pillars, the containment. And this containment I mentioned on one of these pillars is necessary in Yemen, in Lebanon, in Iraq, and also in Syria. Building a sustainable peace in, uni- in a united and inclusive Syria requires, indeed, that all powers in the region respect the sovereignty of its people and the diversity of its communities. In Syria, we work very closely together. After prohibited weapons were used against the population by the regime of Bashar al-Assad two weeks ago, the United States and France, together with the United Kingdom, acted to destroy chemical facilities and to restore the credibility of the international community. This action was one of the best evidence of this strong multilateralism. Beyond this action, we will together work for humanitarian solution on the short term, on the ground, and contribute actively to a lasting political solution to put an end to this tragic conflict. And I think one of the very important decisions we took together with President Trump was precisely to include Syria in this large framework for the overall region and to decide to work together on this political deal for Syria, for Syrian people, even after our war against ISIS. (laughs) <laughs> that's that's this containment plan and yeah uh, yeah is yeah, this just, guy just, just crazy is he just a clown is he um is he serious yeah yeah just real quick let's just dispatch with this whole iranian influence in the region thing he lists four four countries iraq uh, Iran only has the influence it does in Iraq right now because of the 2003 invasion by the United States. We went there. We disenfranchised the Sunnis. We backed uh, Iran backed parties like the Dawa Party, the Supreme Council for Islamic Revolution, etc. Uh, we basically de-Sunified Baghdad in favor of Iran backed Shia parties. So thank America for Iranian influence in, in Iraq. Now, Yemen, uh, Yemen is a case where they claim there's all this Iranian influence, but there's really no evidence of it. Uh, a great journalist named Gareth Porter, uh, no relation to him, but uh, Gareth Porter has debunked this claim that uh, that ships had stopped in the in the I forget what the, the port is there, that, the, the, that these ships were en route for Yemen to bring them small arms from Iran. But Yemen is awash in small arms. They're one of the most armed societies on planet Earth. And it's more likely that those shipments were actually headed for Somalia. And so in, in Yemen, it, there's really no case to be made. They say this all the time, that Iran is, is has all this influence there. But in fact, the Iranians, uh, Tehran, asked the Houthis, the rebels in, in Yemen, not to take Sana'a, the capital, in 2014. And so Iran's name is really not on Yemen. Uh, in Syria, we can move there. It's been America and its allies' support for the Sunni rebellion there that invited Iran's presence there in the first place. In 2015, that's when Iran got directly involved in Syria. So again, thank America and its allies for the Iranian presence there. And now finally, South Lebanon, uh, they're talking about Hezbollah, of course. And Hezbollah exists to counter Israel. And so that's like a separate issue. Yeah, Iran has some ties with Hezbollah, but it's not they're not uh, owned, you know, uh, entirely by Iran. And so I don't know. I just find all four of these areas. It's like he, he has no leg to stand on. Yeah, it's true. 
Right, and he and he presents this from the perspective that what all all the what the Western powers are trying to do is preserve uh, Syrian sovereignty, and it's Iran that's coming in and, and getting involved and in, and in trying to undermine that. When it's clearly the other way around, that Assad is has a plurality at least of Sunni support and has support from pretty much every other minority group. Uh, the Kurds are in a little bit of a different position right now because they're getting a lot of U.S. backing, which I'm sure is like, you know, kind of changing their outlook on this situation, thinking you know, that they might be able to get a little bit more. But at the same time, like everybody would prefer to live under Assad than whoever uh, the, the rebellion there was going to end up putting on the throne because it looked like it would have been uh, some sort of either jihadist or Salafist uh, type of, of leadership there. And so really, the you know, who's getting in the way of the popular will of the people and who's getting in the way of uh, Syrian sovereignty is certainly not Iran. They're the ones that are defending that idea. But even if we even if we accept his twisted justification, is it even possible? I, I don't really see that it's possible without a major war. How do you do this? I mean, we've talked, everybody's been talking about this lately. You know, how do you, quote unquote, contain um, Lebanon and uh, Syria without getting into a major confrontation with Russia, which would probably lead to a major confrontation with China, would make things with Turkey even more complicated than they are now. Um, and and you're saying you're going to send some of the the regional allies, their troops in there, and that's going to, like, I don't get it. What is containment? Is it just building a bunch of Bases, you know, so these we've already built so many bases around Iran. Uh, more ships, like I don't even get what his containment plan would be. Uh, more missiles, maybe. Right. I mean, I don't know what. I mean, containing Iran it has been the policy since like 2002 in the George Bush administration. I go, you go all the way back and find John Bolton and Dick Cheney complaining about them pretty much as soon as our Iraq war started, and, and so. If you look at what's happened since then, if anything, Iranian influence has only increased, as Will pointed out, especially in Iraq and Syria. And so, you know, all those policy prescriptions that you're talking about that are the possible military options for the United States to take have all been tried and have all backfired in a spectacular fashion. Exactly. Like at this point, I'm really starting to wonder if this guy is... If, if this isn't just something he threw together to achieve two things, one would be to, you know, it's another one of the freak out, another aspect of the freak out reaction to Trump saying he wants to leave Syria and the other being, um, you know, that Trump is going to scrap the Iran deal. Like, did he just put this whole thing together just to counter those two things? And, and he blew it up into this giant world order speech and this, um, comprehensive Middle East plan of containment of Iran. Is it all just complete bullshit? I, I, don't, I, I was having a lot of trouble with figuring out why he said the things he said in this speech. Uh, just because, like I, I said before, it doesn't seem like these are necessarily beneficial to the French people or anything like that. It seemed to me to be a speech directed at, like, you know, the kind of the mainstream establishment, whether, you know, the Fox News, the MSNBC line, and the think tank people who all kind of espouse this uh, kind of view. Of course, with Trump being unpopular and the establishment saying that, you know, he's hurting America and the the world image, America's world image and anything. Maybe Marcone thought that this speech would be a chance for him to kind of, uh, you know, they, they want to anoint somebody, the new leader of the free world. They don't want to be Donald Trump anymore. And Marcone coming and giving this speech, certainly, I, I think, probably adds to that. I mean, he spoke English in it, even though, as we mentioned, it wasn't super great or clear the whole time. But that that's who I thought the speech was directed at, was Congress, the establishment, and, you know, kind of that idea that uh, the West must lead and continue all this interventionism. Yeah, I mean, let's not forget, too, that France used to have, like, France used to be a colonialist power. And so part of this might just be a French leader wanting to sort of retake some of that old prestige of France. I mean, if you remember the Libyan intervention of 2011, there were major French interests there uh, with the whole uh, – you know, Gaddafi trying to introduce some new gold-backed dinar that would challenge the uh, franc that's used in Western and Central Africa. 
And so I don't know, like this speech might just be seen as sort of uh, Macron trying to take a, a prominent place alongside the United States in the global order or whatever, you know, to reclaim some of that old prestige. Yeah, as we were listening to the speech, I was making some comments to my uh, fiance about it, too. And it's just <laughs> maintaining the world order means keeping things, keeping the balance of power the way it was. It, I guess you could see the United, um, the United Nations Security Council. I mean, that's it in a nutshell. The UK, a former empire, France, a former empire, and they have outsized power now, right now, right? And the only reason they do is because of us. And we need them because we can't be seen as, you know, we still are trying to paint ourselves as the good guy. We can't be seen as unilaterally going in and bombing and occupying these countries. So that's nothing new. Like we're, we're used to that. I just, I mean, couldn't he come up with something a little better than they hate us for our freedoms, though? I mean, I, I just, this guy gets sloppier and sloppier. Yeah, it sounds like some of these talking points could have come from like 2005 or something. You know, the the they hate us for our freedoms kind of stuff. Yeah. And then I, I got one last clip, which is um, sort of a finale. And it, it confirms some of the things you guys are saying as to what, what Trump, I'm um, sorry, what Macron is trying to do in the sense of, you know, maintaining their own status and that it's, well, anyway, I'll let you hear it. I believe facing all these challenges, all these fears, all this anger, our duty, our destiny is to work together and to build this new strong multilateralism. On April the 25th, 1960, General de Gaulle affirmed in this chamber that nothing was as important to France as the reason, the resolution, the friendship of the great people of the United States. 58 years later, to this very day, I come here to convey the warmest feelings of the French nation and to tell you that our people cherish the friendship of the American people with as much intensity as ever. The United States and the American people are an essential part of our confidence in the future, in democracy, in what women and men can accomplish in this world when we are driven by high ideals and an unbreakable trust in humanity and progress. Today, the call we hear is the call of history. This is a time of determination and courage. What we cherish is at stake. What we love is in danger. We have no choice but to prevail. And together, we shall prevail. <laughs> Vive les États-Unis d'Amérique! Long live the friendship between France and the United States of America. Vive la République. Vive la France. Vive notre amitié. Merci. Get them all fired up. Viva this and viva that. And uh, <laughs> we need you. You're exceptional. You know, all the things that we don't need to, all the things we need to disabuse ourselves of. You know, it's just... Yeah, I mean, you listen to this guy and like this is common among a lot of hawks, but it's always like 1940 or something. It's always like we're at some great we're at risk of some great peril. We're on the edge of something, you know, catastrophic and we must be decisive and act and triumph over it. And it's just like it's very melodramatic. It's always like this great calamity is just on the, you know, just on the horizon. We will prevail. And he, he goes back, he, he invokes de Gaulle, you know, yeah. a speech and before any of us were born. I just, I don't, I don't get it. I just, I mean, I do get it. I just don't, I don't get that, that he thinks that this is going to resonate. I mean, he did get Congress fired up with the viva, viva this and viva that. And, you know, placing such importance on the United States. Um, but there were some times I noticed in that speech where the, you know, where he was definitely talking about intervention and Syria, um, where the, the the applause was definitely lower. It was definitely not as 
as raucous as the other ones. And, you know, it doesn't take much to get like everybody who speaks in Congress gets a multiple standing ovations. So, you know, I, I, I just don't know if he's completely out of touch, whether he just stirred this whole thing up just because they're so desperate for Trump to not pull out of the Iran deal. And I would say because the EU itself is on shaky ground and, um, you know, they really need this expansion to a business to Iran and presumably they're going to get access to Iran's market. And they think that's one of the things that's going to save them. But, you know, all of the rest of it, I just don't understand how, why it had to be packaged like this. And it worries me because all through it, you know, I, I did wonder, is he, is he making a case for a world war? Which is what I'm always worried about. But, and the, the other, one other thing I want, I always wonder, he doesn't say it in this speech, but it's said all the time. The, all of the, sanctions against Russia and the threats against Russia, they always talk about, you know, our country and European countries, how what we want from Russia is we want them to change their behavior. What do they mean when they say that exactly? What what do they mean? What does what behavior does Russia have to change in order to avoid, you know, us doing more things to them? Well, I mean, this is one of the problems with the expectations put on both Russia and Iran is that they're accused of doing things that they're actually they actually haven't done. If you look at the Skripal poisoning, if you look at the Iranian involvement in Yemen, both of those things didn't happen. And so, you know, both of those countries are asked to prove a negative or, you know, the the idea that Russia invaded Crimea and stole half of Ukraine uh, from the Ukrainians or has expanded into Syria or any of these other narratives that simply aren't true. What is Russia left to do? I, they can't capitulate because there's nothing to capitulate to in, in some of these situations. Uh, the, the same thing with the, the idea that Assad's gassing his own people. They say, well, if Assad stops gassing his own people, we'll stop attacking them. I don't know how Assad's going to stop Al- Al-Qaeda from carrying out chemical weapons attacks in Syria. That's what Al-Qaeda's going to do. And, and Assad can't prevent that. And so... They always put on these just completely unachievable expectations, and whether it's Russia, Iran, or Syria, it's all the same. Yeah, and when it comes to Russia, um, I actually just wrote a piece about this recently for Consortium News, uh, specifically about Ukraine potentially becoming a NATO member. But in that piece, I covered the long history of uh, uh, NATO expanding to include Russian neighbors. And so it's funny that we often hear these, these narratives about Russian aggression, and they point to things like in Crimea, which is its own long story. Um, but really, if you look at the history since the, the fall of the Soviet Union, it's been consistent Western, you know, uh, hostility and hemming in Russia's borders and selling uh, or putting, you know, placing Patriot missile batteries along their borders and doing military exercises. Imagine if Russia were doing these things in Mexico or something, you know, the U.S. would scream its head off. We'd be in the U.N. Security Council in an, in an instant demanding that, you know, something happen. But, um, but yeah, there's just so much hypocrisy when it comes to these accusations. Right. The funniest one was uh, like back during the campaign at one point, Hillary Clinton said something about Russia having troops on uh, NATO's border and the troops were actually in Russia. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. They were it was a base inside Russia. The heck. Speaking of Hillary, I mean, I I really felt like the things that he was talking about, all of these talking points and all these justifications You know, it just sounded to me like it could have been Hillary there or it could have been John McCain there. I've heard John McCain use some of the same terms and all that. And, um, you know, I know I I know what they're trying to accomplish, but they're just still not acknowledging that that path is no longer available. It's not feasible. The things that they're not without a major, not without a world war. And even then, it you know, I don't think that it's guaranteed anywhere near guaranteed that, you know, we could achieve those goals, even with a world war, because a world war is going to end up as a nuclear war. And then, and then what happens, you know, what are you going to be, what, what's the world order going to be? What are you going to reign over? Right. Yeah. Something tells me they just don't care. They just don't care about the risks of world conflict that they're, they're generating here. Uh, You know, prior leaders haven't seemed to care much about these things. We've been in world wars before, and so it just, I don't know how much they're concerned about it. I mean, I'm sure they make money off of, in some one way or another. I'm sure they benefit. Um, I don't know about Macron specifically, if he has any particular interest in this. 
as far as missile defense or something, arms contractors go. But yeah, I'm just not sure they're too, I'm, I don't know if they're too concerned about this as we, as we would be, you know? Hey, did you, did you guys catch the Merkel visit? That was kind of odd. It was a one day visit, you know, right after, I mean, immediately, like the next day, right after, after Macron, what happened in that visit to Trump? What did she do? I missed that whole thing. Yeah. I just watched the presser between them. They gave a joint press conference and, Really, on the Iran and the Syria issues, Merkel said a lot of the same things that Macron said. Like, yeah, there's all these outstanding issues with Iran and we're very concerned and just, you know, paying the basic lip service to it. But um, a lot of the presser between Merkel and Trump had to do with like trade relations and uh, NATO paying more of their fair share and stuff. So it was less, I mean, it was still foreign foreign policy related, but less military uh, related, I guess. Yeah, I guess it's worth knowing. I, I saw Pompeo's first speech as Secretary of State in front of NATO. And a reporter, I believe a German reporter, asked him, uh, is Germany meeting their NATO obligation? And Pompeo said no. Nowhere near. I think that whenever they talk about paying fair share with NATO, I think they're almost always talking about Germany. Especially yeah, Germany. And- and Merkel had even said something. She kind of like gave a concession, like, you know, we've we've had some progress on this issue, but we admit that, yeah, it's not enough and that we need to do more. And so she did sort of acknowledge that. So Although she's I- on board. She's totally on board with this Macron, you know, comprehensive four pillar deal. Seems like it, unfortunately. Now, I was ha- I had some like optimism about Merkel because she seems to be pretty good on like the Ukraine issue specifically. Like she seems to recognize what that really means about, you know, trying to bring Ukraine into NATO and stuff. And so I don't know, I thought she might, you know, give a little more pushback to these kind of things. But, you know, given the position that Germany's in not paying their fair share or whatever, maybe she feels pressured. And she's I feel weakened like, politically. She's seriously weakened. And I feel like Germany is the big loser from these uh, geopolitical pushes. The sanctions against Russia have prevented that natural gas pipeline. Was it the Nord Stream 2 from being built from Russia to Germany, which would significantly reduce the cost of German energy? Uh, Germany is really looked at the market of Iran. I mean, Iran is a relatively wealthy country. There's 80 million people or so in Iran. And uh, it's one of them, you know, unlike Iraq, its neighbor, it wasn't destabilized by a civil war, same, you know, with Syria uh, and Libya, other large oil producers. And of course, you have the situation in Venezuela. So Iran's in a very good position. And, you know, so long as there's not a civil war there, I would expect that you know, the, them to have a stronger economy that's, you know, worth trading with these European powers. And it seems to me that, you know, Germany would be the biggest loser. So it surprises me that Merkel's been so willing to go along and isn't kicking and screaming a little bit more about Trump threatening to vacate this Iran deal. Because, of course, even the threat of Trump uh, vacating the Iran deal puts it at risk and makes countries less likely and less uh, wanting to do business with Iran because, of course, if, you know, sanctions are going to be in place that invalidate your contract in six months. Then is it really right. worth putting the capital in to, to facilitate the meetings and everything you need to do and build the production plans or whatever to, uh, you know, get the contract in place in the first place? Yeah, this is what Bob Higgs calls a uh, regime uncertainty. And that's definitely there in Iran. I remember the the very day that the JCPOA deal was signed, they said there were jets landing from Germany, landing in Tehran. I mean, they really want to do business there. They want to continue and expand business with Russia as well. And uh, yeah, I don't understand how, um, well, maybe they're dealing with this in a more covert way, which is possible. Like, ha- have they shut down that Nord Stream pipeline? It's still going ahead, isn't it? I was under the impression that these sanctions uh, specifically prevented the, that pipeline from being built, that there there was uh, sanctions against building international pipelines or energy transfer equipment uh, that, that specifically I put that pipeline in some cases on hold. A new batch of sanctions or the original? Uh, I believe the ones from the, the Crimea, uh, post Crimea. Oh, OK. Yeah, they've been in place for like four years now. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so I think that's all I've got on the Macron visit and I've kept you a really long time. So anything, anything else we think we need to touch on before we sign off? I guess just like wrapping up, I'd say, uh, this speech, you know, it was a lot of lip service, a lot of sort of, uh, boilerplate stuff. You know, I think some of it is just sort of like, like we had sort of discussed paying lip service to Congress and their, their biases and prejudices. Um, 
But what I think is significant about it is, is maybe specifically the Iran deal stuff. And I think that's really what you want to watch uh, going forward. Uh, Trump has to recertify on May 12th. I think Trump has to recertify the Iran deal, which means that U.S. sanctions will again be like postponed. Uh, but if he doesn't, then sanctions will reapply to Iran. And who knows what's going to happen after that? The Iranians have come out and said that, you know, they might start enriching uranium again. That probably doesn't mean they're going to go after a nuke. But, uh, yeah, I think that's probably the most important part of the speech. I agree. The Syria and Iran stuff is really important. And it's just a shame that, that you know, that's the view. I, I mean, of course, in France, you had Marcon being elected over Marine Le Pen, who seemed to be a little bit against this internationalism. So maybe that, too, was a part of uh, Marcon's speech. And the uh, you know, reason behind it was that the opposite push in France seems to be for that, you know, more extreme nationalism. Uh, but at the same time, the solution isn't to kill people in the Middle East as well, even if it's not, you know, Le Pen's kind of racist nationalism, isolationism, whatever the hell she thinks. Yeah, I kind of saw it as a mishmash of all the, you know, our allies uh, in the sort of everybody's demands thrown together into this amalgam of a of a plan. And maybe maybe it was blown up to this grandiose thing because. It was one of Trump's camp, another yet another campaign promise that it looks like he's going to go back on. And if he does, he needs some really big explanation as to why, why he would do that. Now I've seen headlines saying that it looks like Trump is going to back out of the deal anyway. Um, But that's not the impression that I got in that presser. One other thing I wanted to, to mention too, is that in Macron's speech to Congress, he says that Trump has agreed to this four pillar. Didn't he say, didn't he say that Trump agreed to this? Your president agreed to this. Yeah. Which is kind of strange. And Trump in the presser, he, you know, he's playing, playing coy saying, you know, oh, I might not, you know, you don't know what I'm going to do on May 12th. And then he says, but you, Mr. President, you kind of know what I'm going to do. Right. Um, I, I think he's staying in it. I think he's going for this four pillar thing. And I don't think anybody thinks that this four pillar thing is ever going to work. It's right. just, it's an emergency move, you know? Uh, yeah, I mean, Iran, Iran is going to see this as an absolute like a uh, slap in the face because the U S is basically bringing up these other issues and threatening to impose sanctions when we haven't even like gone through with all of our sanctions relief for the JCPOA yet. And so the Iranians are like, you guys are art. You guys want to do another deal and you haven't even gone through with the first one. Like yes. they're not, they're not going to accept that. Like by, Absolutely. And so this is totally. almost, this might even might even just be a poison pill just to get them to try to pressure the Iranians to get out of the deal. Who knows? I'm not sure. The position of Iran has been that they're unwilling to negotiate negotiate on the deal. They said they're living up to the deal and they're within the deal and the deal's been signed. And so any kind of proposal seems to be something, at least as of now, Iran has said they they won't accept. And with the the North Korea deal. Uh, why would North Korea enter into any kind of a deal with us if we're just at that, you know, practically at that very moment, breaking this big, very big and hard won deal with Iran? You know, yeah, 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 no doubt. Jeopardize. I mean, look at uh, I mean, the North Koreans. What are they thinking right now when they see John Bolton rising to the National Security Advisor position? When John Bolton is legendary for killing arms control agreements, he killed the uh, the agreed framework with North Korea uh, like ten years ago, twenty years ago. He killed the he helped to kill the ABM treaty with Russia, and so and he's hated. He hates Iran. He's a huge hawk on Iran. And so if the North Koreans see us walk away from the Iran deal like this, how how can they trust us? How can they deal with in good faith with the United States? If we're so bad about keeping to agreements. Yeah. I mean, the only way I guess is if, if China and Russia are, you know, providing guarantees, I think that's the only way a deal could work anyway, yeah, yeah, is yeah. if they give them some security, but and then at the same time, you're demonizing Russia who you need to, I mean, it's just, it's just really... <laughs> it's backwards. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot, guys. This is, this is so much fun. Let's, let's do it again. <laughs> absolutely yeah definitely yeah it's a okay. great time thank you so much for having yeah, us thanks on for having us on okay good night everybody all right, all right take all right. care bye-bye and that's our show thanks for listening a special thanks 
to Kyle Anzalone and Will Porter. Check out Kyle's podcast. It's called Foreign Policy Focus. You can find Kyle's work at immersionnews.com and at libertarianinstitute.org. You can also support Kyle at patreon.com slash foreignpolicyfocus. Find Will's work at libertarianinstitute.org, antiwar.com, and consortiumnews.com. And you can support Will at patreon.com slash wkpjournalist. We are independent media. We rely on your contributions. This podcast is brought to you with the help of our generous donors. You can pitch in by going to patreon.com slash around the empire or by doing one time donations using the links on our website, aroundtheempire.com. Also, follow us at Around the Empire. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and our podcast channels at iTunes and other podcast apps. And that's about it. We'll see you next time. Take care, everyone. Thank you.